uh, Rafael Flores is going to do a masterclass for us. His film, My People Are Rising, uh, is playing tonight at 5 p.m. It's closing out the festival. And we, we just knew we had an opportunity to, we, we, we found out Rafael was going to be here. He's originally from Seattle, now lives in, in Oakland. And he started at the same place that a lot of our other filmmakers started. He made a short film, made a pretty big splash with that short film, got a lot of attention. And you know, really turn that into a career, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, so first off, thanks for coming, and thank you for uh, having me. And um, I mean, what I I didn't quite know what's fair for you, so I, I you know I'm gonna kind of freestyle this a little bit. And I do have some notes that I might refer to on my phone because I'm using my laptop to uh, might show you a clip or two, uh, give you an idea of more or less of my work. But uh, before I kind of like talk about um, what I've been kind of. I guess keys to success for my particular path. Um, I kind of just want to give you an idea of who I am. Um, so I started uh, making films in about 2004, and I originally started as a musician actually, and I was making beats and, and you know doing a lot of writing actually. And in the mid 90s, you know, I jokingly always say everybody wanted to be a rapper, right? But Eventually, something clicked in my mind when I was in college because I went to the University of Washington where I was taking, uh, I didn't know what to take, I didn't know what to study, I really wasn't motivated, I didn't really care about school that much. Um, I always got good grades, but it was nothing really calling my passion. And so, while I was studying at UW, I met a professor, his name was Willis Connick, and uh, he was a very, very famous professor in the cinema studies program at the University of Washington. He also taught comparative literature. And so, when I started taking classes with him, I also was taking a lot of ethnic studies classes because I'm a, a child of Brown Beret and UFW farmer. You know what I mean? So like that's where I come from. That's my personal history. But I was born in the Central District, actually, um, and I was raised there. You know, and I saw the whole community change over time while I was going to college. And um, you know, I one of my professors said, you know, as I was getting ready to graduate, he said to me you know, you should make films, right? And I said, well, there's not really a program at the University of Washington for an MFA at the time. I don't know if there is an MFA program. I'm sure there's not. It's more of kind of like, they have a program, but it's more of like, it's like night school, mm -hmm. and, and it's not a re it's not like a, a bachelor's degree, it's just more of a certificate program. Right, right, and so, and there was also a similar program, Sherman Alexi, because I, I did an independent study with Sherman Alexi at the dub while he was teaching in the Indian Studies Department, and there was the Native Voices program, but it was very, like, indigenous, native focused, right? And I was much more interested in a lot of other different things. So I said, uh, I took a year off of school, I didn't really care too much about what I was doing, and I, but I did buy a camera, and I started interviewing just something that I was interested in, because me coming from the music background was all the artists that I knew in the, the Seattle hip-hop scene. And so I started interviewing hundreds of artists, MCs, boys, break dance, I mean like every type of hip hop element and culture you could think of in Seattle. And so, and I had grown up with a lot of these people, right? So one of them in particular was a guy named Santonio Bandanas who was part of the Universal Zulu Nation, right? And they had like a really strong community presence in the central district of Seattle and still do, right? And he kind of, I, I started interviewing him and through him I kind of got access to a lot of people I otherwise wouldn't have had access to. I even, you know, interviewed Macklemore before he became what he is now, right? So I have like interviews with him when he was wearing the fleece and the sideways hat, trying to be like, you know, with the mic, with the MJ, MJ's on, you know, and he, he was a totally different person, right? And so it was a really special time when we were documenting that. So basically, with no resources on how to make films, I decided to take a class, I think it was the Seattle Film Institute or something like that, and it was like a little house that's in, like just down the street in the Central District, and I said, I said okay, I will. Paid 300 bucks, I'll take this seminar. And I was the youngest guy in this. It was all like older white men, you know what I mean? And I'm like, it's me. And I'm like, holy shit, like, maybe I'm getting into something I don't know if I can handle, you know what I mean? But I just asked a bunch of questions. I took notes, like copious notes, and asked so many questions in, in like about a three to four hour seminar. And then I went home and I just started editing all the footage that I had filmed, right? Experimenting, testing the limitations of the platform, seeing kind of experimental effects I can create. It's pretty much what every new editor does when they kind of start editing, right? And I put together, uh, I was applying to grad school. I decided, okay, well, I'm gonna apply, get my MFA, right? So I actually applied to a bunch of different film schools all around the country, 
and see which ones I can get into, right? And that's like a whole job in itself, right? And you have to put these, you know, elaborate application materials together and do all this like stuff. Each school has a different criteria, et cetera. And I ended up settling on going to San Francisco State. And the reason for that was because it was one similar to Seattle, the culture at least. Uh, two, it was cheaper, right? Uh, and then three, it had this legacy of, you know, Francis Ford Coppola and August Coppola starting this film school there. It also was the home of the first ethnic studies department in the world. And it has a huge, like, revolutionary kind of background. And so I said, okay, I feel comfortable there. I'm going to go there. And, you know, I just grinded out. And I started, I kind of put this Seattle hip-hop documentary on the shelf. Because I said, oh, I got to do all this, all this, you know, assignments. And they were teaching me how to film on 16 millimeter, right? Which is like, you don't even really see that anymore. Right? I mean, people are shooting digital now, right, for the most part, um, or at least indies are. And so that was like a whole experience in itself. And I actually, the first, like, as a class assignment, we said, okay, well, I want, we got to do a short doc. We got to shoot it on 16 millimeter. And then, like, telecine the whole process, digitize it, color correct it, all of it, right? And so I said, and they were going to pay for the telecine too, the school. So I said, how can I, like, it, turn this into, like, a project that I can add to my portfolio? Right? Because you want to build your portfolio, right? That's At the end of the day, that's what you want to do. So I said, okay, we all pitched the idea, and my idea was chosen, and then we decided to do a documentary about this 19-year-old kid who started the scraper bike movement in East Oak, who I saw on social media, a YouTube video, when I was living here in Seattle. And I said, oh, that's cool. It's like, it's a scraper bike, right? And it had this, like, theme song, and it had, like, millions of hits, right? It was viral. And I said, how come nobody's doing a documentary on this guy? So I called him. Or actually, I got in contact with him through social media, actually. And he was like, yeah, come. You guys want to come film, film us? That's fine. Come to the bike shop. And so we went out there with 16 millimeter cameras in East Oakland. Like a really rough neighborhood, right? And, you know, we, we just filmed him and interviewed it. We put it together. And, you know, with limited resources. I mean, I think we had about $200 to make this film. You know what I mean? And I went out there on my own time with my... T it was a uh, mini DV camera, right? And I went out there and was just filming them. Right, but like constantly, like looking over my back, making sure I'm like I'm not gonna get robbed, like because I don't know this community. I'm not from here, right? And so I'm just filming, and then eventually we edited it, we inter spliced it basically. It was a mixed media project, and we submitted to a bunch of film festivals, and it got into Cannes. And this was the first year I was in grad school, right? And so I said, oh, I guess I gotta go to France now, right? So I went out to France and. That in itself, just going to a film festival with the marketplace is like such an educational opportunity. I mean, that is where you see films being bought and you learn how to network and you learn how to sell, which is an art in itself, right? And finance, get finance for your next project too. And so I, I, I was, I, you know, I was up in the chateaus, I'll never forget this. It was a private party for film screeners and distributors basically that come in and it's a very small intimate kind of thing. and. I met a guy who, and I learned so many from my mistakes, right? So don't repeat my mistakes, right? And and I said, he said, well, what's your next film that you're going to create? And I said, oh, well, I'm going to, uh, I have this feature that I'm working on, right? Of course, you know, you're going to pitch a feature. And he says, uh, okay, cool, send me your treatment. I made the terrible mistake, right, of sending him a long, long treatment and also a, a script that I had been working on. He didn't read it. Never heard back from him again, right? But I thought it was so ironic that I had to go all the way to France to meet somebody who was from Santa Monica to, <laughs> you know, get financed, right? So you never know who you're talking to. You don't know where you need to go to, to make that connection. Um, so you definitely got to get out there. And so anyway, after the Scraper by King, you know, film went viral and did really well and, and you know, toured all around the world and stuff like that, I said, okay, well, I got to work on my thesis. So I said, well, what am I going to do for my thesis, right? And I had been uh, following the news, and at the time, it was about two years prior to like me actually creating films, I had a friend who was murdered on 23rd and Union. He was the owner of Philly's Best, who was the second owner, actually. Right? The first owner was also killed. Right? And it was a very mysterious murder. But anyway, the second one, I knew the individual who had murdered him, and I knew the person who was murdered. Right? So I said, wow, this is... I, I just started studying it and trying to figure out what was going through this guy's head, right? And when I was reading the news, people were calling him a monster. They were calling him dehumanizing things. And I said, wait, 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 wait. He was a foster kid, right? He was probably sexually abused. He was homophobic. He was xenophobic. There's something going on with this kid. So 
you know, the Central District is very tightly knit, and I started reaching out to a lot of community members, trying to figure out, just as me, curious, you know, like, why, why did he do this? Did you know this guy? And I knew a lot of guys who I went to school with who went to O'Day High School with him, and they would tell me stories about him in high school. And eventually, I was started casting for this narrative film that I was adapting all the facts of the case into, right? And I ended up bumping into his foster brother, who wanted to play him in the film. And I was like, oh my God. So I interviewed him, right? And it started as just research as a documentary, right? But then I started slowly weaving it into the narrative elements that I had created to try to create a form of docu-fiction, experimental, with the theme of displacement in Seattle, right? Because ultimately what, I, what my research led me to understand was that in gentrified communities, there is not, it's a mental health issue, right? For communities of color, right? Especially young men of color. Right? And there's like actual scientific explanations for this. I'm not going to go into it, but basically what I learned and, and discovered is there's a scholar at the Morehouse School of Medicine. His name is Frederick Murphy, and he's a very famous black psychiatrist. And he was publishing a book, and I reached out as, as research, so saying, like, well, how is gentrification alienating young men of color to the point where they're committing hate crimes, frankly, right? And I started to look at research from the 80s in San Francisco and a lot of other West Coast cities. And you saw it actually with the murder of Harvey Milk in the Castro district. It used to be a Latino neighborhood, actually, in Castro, right? But then it became like a safe space for the gay community. And what happened was that there was tension amongst uh, young Chicano communities who were very Catholic in their values on the Dolores Corridor with this district. And this happened in the 80s. And so I looked at what was going on in Seattle at that time with the conflict between the Ethiopian and the black community. Because that's ultimately where a lot of the, the hate came from, where he committed the murder, right? And so I started interviewing community members in, in the Central District, and eventually put this story together, and we actually were able to film at the actual location where the murder happened, uh, partially. And we, uh, yeah, we, we, we just, it was a great project. We had a soundtrack, and we just really promoted it, and we got, like, the best local filmmaker award at the Langston Hughes International Film Festival here in the Central District, and... It toured a lot of other places. It went to the Golden Lion Film Festival in Africa. And I got a letter from the president of uh, Lesotho, I believe is how you pronounce the country's name. And he said, thank you for reminding us here in Africa that American tribalism is alive and well. And I said, whoa. Like the impact of a, of a film like that, like I had never been to Lesotho. I wasn't able to travel there. But the fact that they appreciated it made it rewarding, right? And so. After graduating with that, I decided to return back to my love story project that actually got me involved with all of this in the first place, which was truly a, a, a transmedia project, if you think about it. Because we have performance artists, media artists, visual artists, audio artists, right, all being featured in this documentary. So we went back, and I actually found out that somebody was going to try to basically create the same film as me with the same title. And so that kind of lit the fire under my ass. And I said, oh man, I better finish this project. And it was right before Macklemore was gonna just explode, right? So I said, okay, we gotta go get these interviews. So I traveled up here again with like 400 bucks, 500 bucks to make the film happen. And we had DSLR cameras and we just got all these interviews and really finished the project the way that it should have been finished. And it just, the result was my first feature documentary, right? And that uh, got, recently got the distribution deal, and that's kind of where my, a lot of the work that I'm doing now is kind of focused. But in essence, Green Eyed Media, my production company and media collective, started as a mixture of intellectuals, urban youth, and just independent artists all coming together under a house, right, that we had over here by the university district, just renting it. It was very bohemian, right? And they continued doing their thing after I left. And they were making music videos and doing music, and I actually ended up opening a studio in San Francisco. We actually got displaced out of San Francisco because it was so expensive to maintain rent there. So we moved over to Oakland, and now we have a studio in Oakland uh, that's doing very well, and it's the first official studio. But we also have a production house in Los Angeles, and we're trying to get it started in San Diego as well. And I'm a, actually a dual citizen. I'm a Canadian and Mexican citizen, so I'm actually trying to put it into uh, Vancouver and Tijuana, too, to create a system, essentially, of uh, studio chain, basically, independent artists, right? So that's what we're trying to do, something similar to that, at least. Um, and so through that, right, I uh, continued making films, and, and I, you know, work in the nonprofit industry, 
right? And so after I graduated from film school, right, I moved to LA like everybody else and I tried to live the dream, right? But what I don't realize is I couldn't get a job, I didn't know anybody, I was sleeping in my car in the alleyways in Los Angeles County, and the only dreams I had were born in the backseat of my car when I was asleep, right? And getting, you know, the police knocking on the window saying, hey, you gotta get out of here, you know? And so that was the life in Los Angeles, and I eventually got a job uh, as a screenwriter for Telemundo because I could write in Spanish, right? And so I said, okay, well, if, it was very hard, right, to get a job, and eventually, I was kept on applying for jobs, and I saw this director position, right, uh, for a multi-million dollar nonprofit in East Oakland, the same place where I had filmed the Scraper by King, right? So I submitted my application. They're like, oh my God, like you want to work here? And I said, I guess. I don't know what I'm getting into. I've never done anything like this before. But they, I basically became the director of uh, a nonprofit arts department within a larger nonprofit. And we had about 13 academic programs. And I was doing a lot of administrative work and learning how to write grants, right? To get money for my productions, right? And so to me, that's where I said, okay, I can make the content, I have the collective, I have the resources to make the project, but I need to get financing, I need to get distribution, right? At the end of the day, right, you can make as many films as you want, but if nobody sees it, what's the point, right? So we started searching for distribution deals and we started uh, and, and again you know I, I came out with a film last year actually it was about my grandmother it was about the repatriation movement and it went to Cannes again and so I went out there two years ago actually and did the same thing tried to this time with a new more focused effort knowing where I needed to go who did I need to talk to how was I gonna get financed and eventually through that we got a distribution deal for that one particular film and then you know, I, we're really trying to keep our options as open as possible with Vimeo. You know, there's a lot of great opportunities there. Amazon Prime is another one. Um, those are probably the two main competitors right now, but there's a bunch of other ones too. Now, everybody's always focused on Netflix, but you know, there are other ways to get your films out there, right? They might actually be more lucrative too, right? So you have to, you know, weigh and balance everything when you're kind of approaching this. But um, yeah, so I mean, that that's basically my, in a nutshell, what I, how I got to where I am. Um, now, you know, writing grants, right? Like we're currently working on a feature length documentary, or actually it's a feature length narrative film, actually. And it's 23rd in Union, but it's almost like a continuation of it because what's happening in Oakland is almost identical, but you know, slightly different, right? And so that's called E14, East 14. That's the next project. Uh, we've raised, finally finished uh, development on it and we're gonna get ready for production in the spring. So that's currently where I'm at right now, right? But when I'm, in this nonprofit field, right, I started to naturally gravitate to being more of a producer, right, because helping other people tell their stories, right? And so I said, okay, well, if I'm gonna be a producer, I gotta figure out how to really refine my grant writing skills, make sure that I'm raising money, and, and be able to explore all these distribution opportunities, right? So, a couple of things, right, as a producer, you know, since this is a master class, you guys might wanna learn something that might be useful, right? So, um, you want, you know, number one, you want an original idea, right? That's the most important thing that you want. Number two, you want to make sure that it has some marketability and some star power. That's what they're going to say in LA. I don't like that. That's Hollywood. But to be honest with you, I have to. You have to understand that it's the star system. Hollywood is born on the star system, right? And if a producer is entertaining a pitch from you and you don't have any star power or some notoriety. Is somebody who's coming with a fan base already, sometimes it might be a social media star. That's my argument, right? Is that the star is born every day on the internet, right? So how can you leverage that, right? So things are changing in Hollywood, slowly, right? But it's still, you know, if you want to get to a certain level, you've got to at least get some not notariable indie actor in your project, right? So, and then also the marketability of it, right? Like, are, what are other films that are similar to yours, and how much did they cost? I have a cousin who works at Netflix, uh, Proving budget expensive, right? And he tells me, like, for, he went to the MBA school at UCLA, so he knows his shit, right? And he basically looked at it, he goes, we have a formula. We look at how many likes you have on, on your, your fan pages, we look at your IMDb rating, we look at, you know, all these other things, you know, how many hits you have on your Instagram, how many other films like yours were financed, how much did they gross, how much did they lose, etc. And we come up to a number. And if the number is less or more than this number, that's how we decide whether we're going to find so it's, it's mathematics, right? At least that's what they would have to think. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure there's more going on there because you can pay to play, basically. And that shouldn't be that way. I mean, the music industry has been operating like that for millennia, 
<laughs> so, you know, it's not really a big surprise, but there are ways to get in. You can get your foot in the door. You just got to be able to go out there and meet those people. They say in Hollywood that if I can't buy you a cup of coffee, why would I work with you? Right? They also say you come to L.A. to sell things. You don't come here to make them. I mean, that's becoming more and more of a reality, right? I mean, these are the conversations that you hear. You'll hear these things come up, right? Did you get a chance to watch our, our boot camp video? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we start every year. We invite our local filmmakers to come in. Mm -hmm. And it's all about building your audience, starting to build your audience, this opportunity that you have to have your film in the stem. Because that audience, that's how you're going to get the funding for your next film. It's not going to be because your script is really, really good. It's right. going to be because you've got that audience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we, we, we try to, you know, and that's also one of the most rewarding parts of it, too. You know, you got to remember that is being you know, interact with people who have like ideas, who are inspired by your projects, and vice versa, right? Supporting other filmmakers, too, right? Like, we all have to support each other because at the end of the day, right, like we, we, all we have is each other, <laughs> you know? We have to cultivate that. Yeah, we, um, we program filmmakers here at Stiff, not films. Right. And one of the things that really kind of used to upset us before we started the boot camp, before we started looking at the filmmaker and telling filmmakers they have to attend and they have to come and see other people's films is they would never come to see other people's films, mm -hmm. just coming for their own film and, right. then, and then leaving. And now we basically say, hey, awards are tied to your development as a filmmaker. We want to see you at the the parties, we have parties and nobody comes, right. things like that. Yeah. And not anymore, now uh, people come out and see other people's films, they come to the award ceremony. Yeah. Usually we had to call people to say, hey, you might want to come to the award ceremony, otherwise nobody would even get the award ceremony, that's it's crazy. That's a sense of community, yeah. right? Yeah, that's that's very, a very Seattle thing that, yeah. yeah. I love that, you know what I mean? That's what makes, and you know, and some of the crews that I've had in Seattle have been some of the best friendships I've ever made with people working on projects that we still stay in contact. And that's how you actually get other jobs, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Right? They'll call you back and be like, hey, do you remember that one art director? She was awesome. Like, let's get her on, on set. Right? I actually did that last week, actually. Um, okay, so original idea, right? Marketability. Similar films that we talked about, right? Because they're always going to ask you that question. And then do you have a profound premise? And I think that this is what I teach at SF State, right? A lot. Because I teach documentary film. I teach digital film production. I teach Latin American cinema, right? Every class that I teach, I emphasize the importance of a premise. And a lot of people don't know what a premise is, or they have a misconstrued idea of what a premise uh, is, right, in a film, right? So let us be clear, right? A premise is what your artwork is based on, right? This is how we build theory and practice, right? And I don't care what kind of art you create. And I don't care whether you are not intentionally trying to do it. Sometimes you do it by mistake. Right? And your premise changes as you're creating the film. Sometimes you might be thinking, oh, I'm trying to communicate this premise, but in reality, it's something else that I'm trying to say, right? So at its basis, right, a premise is going to be some type of statement that you're trying to make. You can boil it down and call it a moral of the story if you want to. It tends to be a cliche premise if you do something like that. But a premise is something that you are trying to communicate as an artist that you have an opinion on and you, it's kind of, you can think of it kind of like a hypothesis of sorts, right? But you have to be clear about what you're trying to communicate, right? Now, you don't ever share your premise with the audience. You let them figure that out, right? But a premise should not be more than a sentence or two. I remember getting financed for the Black Panther film that's in this film festival, and I remember one of the executive producers coming to me and saying, all right, give me an executive summary and I'll consider your film. And I said, what's an executive summary? They didn't teach me that in film school, right? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff they don't teach you in film school. So I had to go look it up and put together a basically a one page, right? And it would include right your shooting ratio, your duration, your genre, uh, your log line, your tagline, your synopsis, plot summary, generally speaking, is what's on it, right? It's one page, right? Because they're not gonna read your script. They're not even gonna read your treatment. They'll look at your executive summary, and if you can get hook them, then they'll read your treatment, if you're lucky. Got to be honest with you, and even then, they might read the first page of your treatment. The treatment shouldn't be long, by the way. A treatment for a short film is one to two pages, right? A, a treatment for a feature is going to be five to ten. Usually, they're not going to read more than ten pages. I got to be honest with you. Now, later on, if you yourself want to develop that out, sure, great, right? But that's for you at that point, right? All right. So you got to get your premise. You have to be. You have to make a definitive statement that cannot be easily accepted. I'll give you an example of a bad statement uh, or premise. 
If you work really hard, your dreams can come true. That's a terrible premise, right? Because every most people would agree with that, right? But if I'm making a film like 23rd and Union, I'm saying that gentrification not is not only an access to health issue, it's literally creating a psychological condition on young men of color to the point where they will react with violence. Now I'm saying something that's a very opinionated statement, right? Now I could, how I choose to show that in my film, well, that's up to you. But if it's not related to the premise, cut that. The premise is like, what does this have to do with the story, right? Don't go down these tangents, right? Because typically what Hollywood does is it boils down the story into a love story, the B story, right? And you're like, wait, well, what about the main conflict? Right? Now, you know, you could say, oh, this is a very academic or a very structural way of making films, right? But I mean, I firmly believe that you have to learn the rules before you break them, right? And even so, even if you break them, you still have a premise. You're still communicating something, because if not, then why are we creating art, right? So that's number one, right, is, is the idea of the premise. And you can think about it as A plus B equals C, right? If there is a condition, right, and this is happening, then this will be the result, right? That's the easiest way to think about it, right? So make sure that it makes coherent sense. Now, a more complex premise might be like two sentences, right? You don't really want to go too far. And when you're writing a scene or when you're creating a shot list, you want to make sure that that is related back to the premise, right? Everything has to be related back to the premise. The style, right? That the performance, everything, right? So that it holds water, right? That it says something, right? Um, so what I like to do actually with, with people, right? Um, oh yeah, here's here's another one, right? There must be a conflict in your purpose. It can, there, I mean, if there's no conflict, how are you gonna write a story, right? You have characters, right? But there has to be some desire, some want, some motivation, and a conflict that's preventing them from doing that, right? That's how you drive the story forward, right? Whatever it may be. It might be a psychological conflict. It doesn't necessarily have to be with somebody else, right? Um, what else here? Uh, so I'll give you, uh, okay, hold on. So, I'll give, so I say here, the best films have an objective, right? That's another thing. What is your objective? What do you hope to achieve from this film? I mean, Errol Morris created The Thin Blue Line, and he got somebody off of death row with that film. You know what I mean? So, like, if that is an objective, right? Um, another example would be, uh, what do I have here? Oh, Moonlight, right? Moonlight wanted to open the doors and shed the light on black, gay experience in this country, right? So it had a very clear objective, right? We don't, I, I'm not down with creating art for art's sake. I'm sorry, that's just me. I come from a very social justice activist point of perspective, right? That we try to accomplish something. And so a lot of the films that I do are tied to some policy measure, right? That we're talking about. So we actually go to the state capital in Sacramento and try to change the policy, right? Because film is a tool. And what I studied was the 1960s and 70s third cinema movie right, in the third world, right, which the Hour of Furnishes being the only film to date that I know of, right, that it actually created a national revolution after it was screened, right? Now, I don't know if that was their objective or not, right, but I mean, that clearly had an impact, right? And so sometimes you have to consider the social value and impact of the film, right? You could argue that, uh, what was it, Al Gore's, uh, the, the, the environment, yeah, the inconvenient truth, that's an example of something that had social value. Right, and so you could get finance for that. So it's not always, right, whether it's marketable, right, but there is some value. You know, those producers and people who finance your projects are being very few and far between, which is the reason why you need to develop relationships with people in those markets. And you should also think about creatively about how you're financing films. I've heard stories of people financing documentaries by finding some Russian oil baron and going out to an oil rig and pleading for money with him. And he's saying, I will do it if, because the documentary's about a band, right? And he says, I'll do it if that band plays in my daughter's wedding. She calls the band, she's like, you guys gotta be in Russia to do this wedding, because we're gonna do this documentary, right? So, but who would have thought to go do that, right? To, and to take a risk like that, right? So no risk, no reward, right? So you do have to kind of go all the way in. There, don't half step on anything, right? And the details and the perfections is what's gonna make a, a, a award-winning film. Right? That attention to detail, going above and beyond that extra mile. Don't be lazy, right? Um, what else here? Always ask yourself, why should I care? I see that in my student scripts all the time. I'm like, why should I care? Like, this is important to you, obviously, right? But well, how are you going to make it appeal to me? 
right? And that's the beauty of the premise. The premise should be a universal message that everybody can relate to, right? The most classic one is Shakespeare, right? But you have uh, it's Romeo and Juliet. What's the premise of Romeo and Juliet? Does anybody know? Love conquers all, even in death, right? Boil it down, right? Okay, so love, love conquers all. How many times have you seen that premise? Right? I mean, Pocahontas, Avatar, Romeo must die. The, it's, the, the, the premise is just regurgitated over and over and over again. And it really ruins your viewing experience when you're a filmmaker because you're kind of like, wow, I see what you're doing. I can predict your film. But, you know, sometimes that's what they want. People want to go into a theater and just kind of zone out and just kind of escape, right? And that's okay. There's, there's a space for that, too. Don't get me wrong, right? But, again, right, you want to have that premise. You want to have something that's profound, right? Um, and then the last thing that I'll kind of just share with you is this idea of form versus content. You know, I get a lot of people saying, this film's revolutionary. I hate when people use that term. It's a really big pet peeve for me. Because what do you mean by it being revolutionary? If you're, look, form and content, okay? Content being what their story's about. Form is about how it is expressed, okay? They must match. If they don't match, there's an inherent contradiction in the film. Okay, so if my film's about revolution, but I'm communicating to you in a Hollywood format, how revolutionary can I be, right? It's like how you speak, it's how you do it, right? Now, there's the mode of production, right? Which is, how are you creating the film? Right, lately there's been this big splash. Uh, I can't remember who was the first, I think it was Robin Williams, right? Who would always have homeless people working on set, right, in that class, right? That's an example of mode of production, right? Put your money where your mouth is. Right? If you're making a story about a community of color, then work with the people in that community, right? Or whatever community it is, right? Just, you know, the way you make it is just as important, okay? So that, that's one thing to understand. So mode of production, informing content, and then your mode of distribution is also important too, right? What are the politics around that company that distributes your media? What other media do they distribute? Ask yourself those questions, because they're winning from you and your content. Remember that. Don't let them guide the conversation. You do take your terms of distribution. I maintain the all rights to direct sale of my content, which means that I can sell my content. You can't prevent me from selling my content. And if we can't get on the same page, then I'm, well, there's no deal. I'm going to go somewhere else. Because they have comp competitions. That's why they all pay to go out thousands and thousands of dollars to go out to Cannes so they can fight for your films, right? And if you're making films with a profound premise, with an original idea, you're winning. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise, right? Um, so forming content, just make sure, you know, when you're watching the next film and somebody calls it revolutionary, or if it's supposed to be commercial, then go in the full commercial format, right? But it must be complementary, right? Um, the last thing that I'll, I'll share with you, which I think a lot of people, because I, you know, I oftentimes get labeled as a documentary film. And I don't know how to feel about that because I don't necessarily consider myself a documentary filmmaker. I think that even documentaries have narratives, right, in them, right? Now, at the, uni the university that I teach at San Francisco State University, there's a very famous guy. His name is Bill Nichols, right? He's a professor emeritus now at this point, and he coined what's called the six modes of documentary representation, right? And this is absolutely fundamental if you're ever gonna make a documentary, right? You, there are similar modes in other, like in narrative forms too, but I'm not gonna get into that, so okay. Six modes of documentary representation, real quick, let me give you examples, and then we'll show you how you can experiment with that, okay? So, number one is the poetic form of documentary representation. It is the oldest form of documentary representation. It is literally images and sounds trying to communicate some type of mood or feeling. One of the first ones was Regan, which is rain, right? It was a Scandinavian film, I believe, that was made, and it's just a study on what happens to society when it starts to rain, and it's a silent film black and white, made in like the 20s, I think, right? Later on, you saw uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Spielberg, and George Lucas all get together for a trilogy with the Cleona Squatsky trilogy. Probably many of you have seen this, right? Where it's just images and sound, feature-length film, epic shots, shot from all around the world, right? And was an example of a commercially successful poetic documentary. Since then, I, there probably have been Baraka, there have been a couple other ones, but they haven't really achieved the same success, probably because of the star power of the director. Right? And the producers, right? So you have to understand that. Okay, poetic. Second one, observational, right? Frederick Wiseman out of New York became one of the best filmmakers for doing this, 
right? He would literally play the fly on the wall, would not interact and trying to get an objective truth, right? So he would do studies of social institutions like school systems, prison systems, hospitals, right? Uh, Titifali's cut, I think, or yeah, Titifali's cut or something like that. That's one about the psychiatric institute and the treat mistreatment of people who are mentally ill, right? And it was a groundbreaking documentary, won a lot of awards, right? He, I can't, I think it was like in the eighties, I want to say. All right, so that's observation. Right? The next one is the most common one, expository. It's the voice of God. It's Morgan Freeman in the March of Penguins. You hear cat, or you see cat. Right? It's evidentiary editing. Right? It's I'm trying to prove a case to you. Here's an interview. They're telling you a fact. You're accepting it and moving forward. Uh, Discovery Channel is a really good example of that. You're watching something and somebody's telling you what you're seeing. Right? So that's expository. Uh, it's probably the most pervasive form. Right? Okay. Then you have reflexive. Reflexive gets a little bit more complicated, right? Werner Herzog is an example of a, a reflexive documentary, documentarian, right? Where he's talking about the process of making the film, trying to explore the subjectivity of the actual project, right? Saying that the observational mode is actually a crock, right? That in fact, there is no such thing as objectivity, right? To so embrace it fully and explore what that truth means for the filmmakers, right? Now that is a very interesting idea because now we're starting to engage with filmmakers as an audience. So these types of documentaries become very popular amongst them. Well, another example of a commercially successful one uh, was uh, Exit Through the Gift Shop, actually, right? Which was reflexive, right? It was about the process of making the film. It has other elements, by the way. That's why that documentary won so many awards, right? Okay, so you got reflexive. Then you have the Michael Moore participatory doc, right? So we're going on a journey. I'm talking to the camera. I'm processing the information for the audience, right? Still kind of subjective, right? All right. That is also more journalistic too, by the way. It kind of lends, but that's a diff. That's not really in this kind of conversation in documentaries. That's more journalism, right? And reporting, which is similar, and it can't have elements of that. Anthony Bourdain actually was a good example of somebody that would mix, right, a lot of different reflexive elements into his kind of expository format, right? All right. Then the last one is uh, see, participatory, performative. Now performative, contrary to what many people think, is not mockumentary. Okay, mockumentary is a fiction film. Borat, fiction film. Okay, let's be clear. There's a script. There's actors, right? A uh, Snow on the Bluffs, another example of one that's a fiction film, right? Okay. Now participatory is slightly different. There's a guy named Marlon. Wiggins, I believe is his name, and he was a black filmmaker in New York in the 80s, and he did a film called Paris is Burning, and it was about uh, gay uh, black men who were in the fashion industry, basically. And they were very flamboyant, and they were almost performing for the camera, but it was part of their life and what they do, right? So it made complete sense, right? So in a way, they're performing for it, but the idea of performance, right, is to find what, to blur the boundaries of truth. Right? To question what truth actually means. Right? And so, and, and figure out where that gray area is. That's what really inspired me. Right? Because it was more one of the more complex ones. Another example of it would be Kumari, which is on Netflix right now, which is Vikram Gandhi, the director. And he plays this uh, cult leader and sees if people will follow him. And it's a study on who, how human beings follow leaders blindly. Right? So he's playing a role, but there is actually you know, uh, 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 some meaning and some truth that you get from this falseness, I guess you could say, right? Now, the, the, the ethics behind that sometimes are a little gray. Sometimes people get really pissed off when they find out that, in fact, somebody was playing a role. And, and I think that Sasha Cohen and Borat, by the way, does border on that, by the way. I think that there is some realism in there, but we don't know if the people being planted in that shot are actors, right? So there's some gray area there, right? So, but that's where it becomes interesting, right? Bill Nichols says that they're not mutually exclusive, that in fact they do mix. And what's interesting is where they overlap, right? So that's where we create new forms of expression, right? New ways to communicate, right? And that ultimately is elevating the art form, right? This is what creates legends, right? People who are able to, uh, in Yaritu would be a really good example right now. He's doing a carne arena, which is like a VR exhibit in Cannes, he did two years ago, right? and trying to elevate the art form, right? So what is that next meeting? So I guess that's where I'll leave, you know, with how can we experiment, how can we create new forms, but still maintain our premise and our commitment to helping people, 
right? Not only with the subject matter, but how we make the film and how we even distribute it, too. So I guess I'll open it up for here. Well, you want to show some clips? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This, yeah. So I, um, I tried my best to bring up the Black Panther uh, website. It's an interactive website, and hopefully it will uh, show you. But basically, we had a community grant to finance this, and it was an intergenerational uh, project uh, where basically we took black youth from West Oakland and Seattle, and we said, okay, we're going to have you guys interview your elders in your community, right, so that you preserve your community's history, right? And so the idea was is that when we pitched the grant, we said, okay, well, we're going to put together a soundtrack, right, to promote the film. We're going to do an interactive website. We're going to do a photo gallery, a poster kind of uh, campaign, and then we're also going to do a, uh, an interactive map right, to preserve the legacy of Oakland so people could go on walking tours, basically. And we should, we're actually thinking of expanding this project uh, to include uh, Seattle as well. So basically, it was much more difficult, by the way, to get grants in Seattle to finance this project, by the way. For some reason, there's a lot more money available in Oakland. But anyway, so these are the, uh, the, the, the stars of the film, Bobby Seale, Erica Huggins, Elaine Brown, and of course, Aaron Dixon, the founding member of the Black Panther Party here in Seattle, right? Happens to be a good family friend of mine. Um, and yeah, I kind of mirrored his trajectory of working for the community, moving from Seattle to Oakland, and he did the same thing in the 68, right, when, you know, Huey brought everybody to uh, Oakland, right? So the Black Panthers, um, we have a bunch of archives, right, and we use this as a crowdfunding source too, mind you, right? So we're, we're actually trying to get money so that we can continue the project, continue preserving the legacy. But we have an amazing photo archive that became available to me because I was a professor at San Francisco State University, and they have an amazing film and television archive there. So I would leverage my, you know, status as I guess as a professor to get access to the stuff, right? And you had pictures of uh, Fred Hampton dead, you know, when he was assassinated by the CIA, Huey Newton and his wife, uh, Elmer Dixon, who was the brother of, of Aaron Dixon, who helped run it while, while Aaron went down to become the bodyguard for the first female chairwoman, Elaine Brown. So Elmer's brother had to take over the Seattle chapter, right? Um, and, and then we have uh, interactive map, and, and as you can see, you know, it's very simple. We were actually trying to do a VR example of this, but uh, we ran out of money, basically. But basically, you can go walk to all these different spaces and see old houses that are still available. Now, the problem is, is that a lot of them are being remodeled or torn down, right? So it's kind of an urgency around this, right, to preserve this. Uh, now, uh, this, the soundtrack was a really amazing project. Uh, we actually partnered with, like, some of amazing group of artists from across the West Coast. Um, and a guy who is from a rapper here called Black Stacks, he's from the Central District, Jace, he was a mentor of mine for many years and he kind of helped me kind of put it together. So we had major artists like from Dead Press to Hieroglyphics to San Quinn, you know, a lot of, lot of amazing artists that were in the hip hop scene that donated their tracks for us to sell this soundtrack, which I have copies of and I'll have one for all of you, is, um, and it was a tool basically to raise money, right, to complete the film, right? So we, we tried our best. We wanted to make a narrative film about it. We couldn't have enough money to hire actors and everything like that. So we decided to do a documentary and try to be as experimental as possible, right? So we are very much experimenting with form in the documentary as well. So I hope you guys get a chance to see it. But I will actually play you uh, the trailer just so you guys have an idea of what the film is about. And then I'll just play you my reel afterwards so you kind of get an idea of the larger work that I do. I guess I should have started out that way, so I don't know.
This is a little bit an outdated reel, uh, but well, actually, do you guys want to see the reel for the, for the studio in Oakland? Sure. Oh, yeah. you want, they're pretty similar, so here, actually, I'll, I'll play the one for the studio in Oakland just because I feel like uh, it might have a little bit newer content. animated bumper that we did but yeah so generally you kind of get an idea a little bit of it but there's lots of trailers on there all of my stuff's on Vimeo Pro so if you guys are ever interested in checking out the content um, yeah so I, I just open up for questions if you guys have any questions for me Can we start talking like let's talk some money like uh, grants you're kind of talking about there's not as many grants in Seattle yeah as some other places I know we have four culture here um, what kind of what level of funding are you finding with grants I mean, each one's different, right? And I think that your approach is, uh, it depends on your approach. You know, oftentimes people apply for multiple grants, right? In order to kind of uh, boost how much money we can make with films, right? So bottom dollar, you need to figure out how much you're gonna pay your crew. How much do you need to get this done? You have your above the line costs, right? Your above the line costs are gonna be your talent, all the essentials that you need to make the film happen, okay? The bare minimum, right? Then you're gonna figure out all your production costs and start with your budget, right? You have to be as realistic and keep it as sparse as possible, right? You have to negotiate with people on how much you're going to pay them to work on your project, right? That's where it helps to build these relationships, right? I have a main director of photography I work with, and he almost exclusively is my director of photography who I work with, right? Um, but I do work with other people. Now, when I create the budget, right, I have to figure out how am I going to sell this project, right? So I have to put together what's called a, a, pro, uh, a project narrative, right? And that's really what they're going to be looking for. Right, as you put together your project narrative, now you're actually figuring out, okay, do I need a fiscal sponsor? It's very, very important, right? That's how I got a lot of the money, was I decided, okay, because of my model, right? My model's a little bit different. I am bridging nonprofit with for-profit, 
Okay, I, I actually did a TED talk on this because it was an emerging kind of field. And this was about maybe seven years ago that I did this, right? When we started to develop social enterprises within nonprofits, right? So the benefit of that, including my own studio, because I actually rent a space to a nonprofit in my own studio, so they become the fiscal sponsor of my studio. So now my private studio, where I rent space and make films, is actually eligible as a 501c3 to apply, right? It's the tax exemption status, right? To apply for grants. Now, you can't just choose any nonprofit. The nonprofit has to be established, right? And has to have some type of reputation. It took many years to develop lots of projects to get the attention of funders, right? So I have a basic grant, right? Before I even came to the organization I'm currently at, right, I was writing grants for Youth Uprising, right? The multi million dollar nonprofit. And I basically had to rebuild this entire department. Right, they had like six studios, right? They had about 13 academic programs. And I said, okay, I need a career pathway grant because that's a million dollars. Okay? And we got it, by the way. It wasn't just, but the thing was is that they reduced our amount to support a health track. So again, it's interesting because the emergence of the mixture of health and education money, right? That's where a lot of the funding is going, right? Now, and it's not just for films. It's also, by the way, for coding. There's a huge emphasis on coding. Because right? they want to diversify the coding industry, right? That's like one of the main initiatives, right? A lot of this comes from actually the My Brother's Keeper initiative, right? Which is a national uh, movement that was started by Obama, right? There's also the Clinton Global Initiative too, which also has corporate responsibility money as well. So that's a whole different realm of trying to get money it's from corporations. That has been a dead end for me personally. We do have some relationships with Adobe because of board members, and they do kind of divert some funds to us, but it's nothing really to sustain a major project or even run a program. Now, why do I apply for program grants? Well, it's more money, right? You can pay people more, right? Now, you can develop a project within your program. So my program is training my crew, and I get paid to train my crew, and they get stipended to come get trained, and then there's a culminating project of some sort. That's what you call a program. Right? And if you think about it, you know, usually a director or producer is going to have to have like informational production meetings with their crew anyway. Right? The only difference is, is that I'm specifically targeting disenfranchised people. That's why I'm going to get the grant. Because right? of the work that we do too. Right? The testimonies of the young people that we have. Right? The projects that they have done. The awards, the accolades. Right? So eventually you start to cultivate relationships with partners. That's what, that's what executive directors do for organizations. Right? They, build relationships and you need a strong executive director if you're going to be fiscally sponsored by a nonprofit or else you're going to have to end up doing all that work. So don't reinvent the wheel. Use somebody who already has a standing in the community, right? Work with them. If you try to do it independently, usually people are doing that because it's private money and they want to be greedy really to be honest with you. Hey, it's a business, you got to make money. I'm not mad at that, right? But I have more interest in not just making money but actually training people because I believe in human capital. Right? I believe that these filmmakers will be able to help me later on in the future, right? So it's an investment in that, right? So that's how I, I write a lot of the grants, and so I, I apply. Every city has a film office, right? Most of them. Yeah, so you kind of start with like local government agencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so you want to make sure that you explore the film office first, right? Because you want to be able to cultivate that relationship. The Seattle Film Office is pretty good. They've waived permit fees for me to make films, right? I've never gotten any money from them be honest with you, and I think it's probably because just the lack of funding. So what we do in California is we have the California Endowment and the James Irvine Foundation, which are two of the biggest foundations other than the MacArthur and the Rockefellers and all them that are national, right? These are statewide, right? So you have municipal, right? You have statewide, right? And then you have national, right? And then on top of that, you have uh, the corporate responsibility funds, right? You have the family foundation funds, you have the national grants, the municipal, and then you have the specific nonprofit grants. Now, the California Endowment really is emphasized on, uh, on young, on health, basically, health initiatives. So how do you bridge media with health? That becomes the idea, right? So we understand that community economic development is tied to health. If you can't feed yourself, how are you going to be healthy, right? So there's a direct correlation with that. So that's how we finally convinced the, the foundations to say, okay, we're going to give you guys money. Now, most recently, it was about the grant officer that you get assigned to. Because the grant officer, if they're down with your cause, they'll back up and let you do whatever you want. That's how I got 50K to make my next film. Oh. Right? It was because the guy was like, I trust what you guys are going to do. I'm going to back up. And which is a, a delightful experience because it took us about 10 years to get to that level with this funding. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So I've been working with the California Endowment for about 10 years and not just with film. 
We do video game design, we do app design. We have a, a youth program it's called Game Heads that basically has won the national competition for social justice video game design. We're working with EA, Brad Free, they're working with Oculus, they're working with all of the big names, Facebook, all of them, right? Because they know that these kids are building games that like the people in the market right now don't even have they don't understand the market. The kids are the market. You know what I mean? That, they're the ones who are consuming the video games, you know what I mean? So we've lately seen a huge emergence in the video game sector. So we've been figuring out how can we bridge film with video games, essentially, to maximize the amount of money that we can get. Yeah, that's that's a lot of what Transmedia is about there, a lot of like storytelling video games. And it, it's mm -hmm. using like, you know, cinematic ideas to, and, and put place those into the game. Absolutely. Yeah, I know in Seattle the Office of uh, Film and Music does not have a grant program, but the Office of Arts and Culture right. actually does have a grant right. program. I believe they only do film every other year, yeah. but like make sure and get on their email list so when they open up that grant you apply for it. And then for culture, they exist, they're, they're pretty much their entire purpose is to administer um, a grant fund that has to do with like a hotel tax. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard if you're a local filmmaker in King County um, to get something usually you know, 1200 1500 a couple thousand dollars um, which is, you know, a really good start if you're, you know, just doing a little documentary, a, a short film, something like that, and they, they'll fund things like that. I mean, yeah. uh, frankly, that's how I had to make my films. I had to build a body of work in a portfolio because they look at your artistic submission for the grant. So you better make sure that that is all squared away, that your resume lives on point. Because if I'm going to give you money, I want to make sure you're going to finish what I give you, right? Like the, the, the job that you propose you're going to do, right? If I have no confidence in that, you're not going to get the money. Right? So that's why your proposal needs to be as extensive as possible and as detailed as possible. Like I said, they don't normally read everything. They'll skim through it and they're like, oh, they want to make sure you did your homework. Yeah, grant writing can be really tough, especially if, you, if you're kind of new to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely something before you submit that grant, just try to find a couple people to just bounce that off of. Can you take a look at it? Yeah. Um, I always find myself not answering, like they're asking a question, you're right, supposed to write a paragraph, and I. The, the response I always get back is, you didn't actually answer the question, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I go back and I redo it, and, and, and I've had a lot more success since I've found people that kind of proofread and kind of help me out with that, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the city of Oakland is really cool, man. Like, they, they give me a lot of money, and, and I go in, and it's very competitive. You're talking about like 30, 40 organizations all going for the same money. And the city has to make the recommendation for the amount of money that's going to be given to the artists, and it's not the same every year. A lot of that has to do with your local politicians do have to, to convince them that they need to invest in the arts, right? Because if not, they're going to get displaced, just like they happened in San Francisco. That's why we're all in Oakland now. You know what I mean? Oakland has one of the highest populations of artists in the country, right? And that's because they all got displaced. And the legislation wasn't necessarily supportive. Now, there are opportunities, right? But you have to think creatively about how you're going to get that money, right? I've, you know, I've worked with people and artists in LA that I, that I give them my fee. I say, this is how much I'm going to charge you to do your music video, right? And they're like, oh my, God. I'm thinking that they're not going to raise the money, okay? Like, I, there's no way, right? He calls me two months later, oh yeah, we crowdfunded all of it. And I was like, what? And then I started to look at how he had a team behind him, right? That were basically getting matching funds from people already pre-committed. Then they hollered at, uh, it was the GoFundMe administration, right? And they were like, hey, can you guys, it's a social justice project, can you bump it up? And they did. Right? You know they have like their little staff pick or whatever, right? So you can be able to leverage that, and then when you open the crowdfunding, you already know the money's there, right? Because who's gonna take that risk, right? You might have to give that money back depending on the website, right? So you've got to think creatively about it. And you know, they always jokingly say, one of my professors, uh, she did the sound for The Godfather, Apocalypse Now. Her name is Pat Jackson, she's like a very famous person, right? Anyway, she studied under Walter Murch, who's one of the most famous editors in the world, right? And she says, jokingly, if you want to be a filmmaker, become a plumber. 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 Okay. Why? Well, because you can have a guaranteed source of income to finance your own projects. Remember that. The more rights you have in your own project, the more money you're making in return on that project, right? But you do have to have strategic people who come on board to help you sell the damn thing. Because that, I'm a terrible salesman. I'm, I'm absolutely awful. So I, but I, you know what I tell? I go, I go speak about distribution in LA sometimes, and they invite me. And you have all these big wigs talking about how to get into the Chinese market and all of that. And I'm like, you know what? Like, if you're trying to conform to that, then I would say that you are headed in the wrong direction. And I'll tell you that because Silicon Valley, right, and Seattle have opportunities for new distribution platforms. We're inventing shit every day. So I think if you're going in that traditional direction, I think you're. 
very mistaken, right? Because the way we consume media is changing, you know? Yeah, and we kind of going back to boot camp, we talk about anybody can get their film now on like Amazon Prime, and every time somebody watches that film, you're going to get like 30, 40 cents. But it's going to be buried under an avalanche of films. It's going to be up to you to get your audience that you're developing, like here at Stiff, right. to start watching that film and leaving those positive reviews. And once you get to a certain number of people that are watching the film and leaving those reviews, then Amazon will take over and start recommending it to other people. Absolutely. But yeah, you yeah. have to start that process. And same thing goes with film festivals too. You know, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, should you still be in a film festivals? I think you should, because again, you're building your audience, but then you'll never know who the festival director will talk to on the next film festival. And so the ideal situation is you get invited to film festivals because your film is making a buzz, right? That's what happened with uh, the Scraper by King, actually. It just kept going and kept going. I couldn't keep up with it. That's how you know you do something, you did something right, right? That's that viral kind of quality. You know? So, do you guys have any questions? Uh, um, so, working on that hip hop documentary and taking that that time, because uh, it seems like there were some years and spaces that, uh, and, and kind of like how our society now is kind of just like go 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 consume now. Did that make you appreciate the time in making? films and that's that long kind of process? You know, that's a funny thing that you asked that because I, that's, I've done like three films like that. I think it took 10 years to make The Blank Canvas. It took six years to make the film in this festival, and My People Rising. And for my grandmother's film that I finished, it took about six years too. And it's it's funny because I'll just shoot stuff and I'll, I'll sort it on a shelf because I have like other things and contracts I'm doing, right? So I have to like pay the bills, right? And it's about staying ahead of what's called the culture of and if you can stay out of the culture curve, your film, will, when it drops, will be, in, 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 the potential for it to go viral is even more, right? That's why you have to kind of predict what's going to happen in a certain way. But to answer your question, I uh, know uh, it was a, a very painstaking, grueling process. And, you know, with that particular film, because of my file management system, it, I actually had to re-log and capture all of my footage. Yeah. And I was in L.A., I locked myself in a room. And it was really hard to do that because there's like a pool outside and like I was, I had a bunch of filmmakers around me all the time. And I'm just like, I didn't even have a couch. I was sitting on the floor editing that film and it had like a stack of tapes. You know what I mean? And I'm just going through it. And you know, with mini DV, you have to let it go real time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was painstaking. But you know, what, it, what I noticed was that all the filmmakers in the house saw me, like dedicated to the, the job, right? And they were like, that's so cool that you're working on your own stuff. Is in LA, you work on other people's stuff. You know what I mean? Like, unless you have the fortunate grace to get financed and get the project as a director, right? You're probably going to be working on other people's stuff. And that's okay, but the grass is always greener on the other side. Remember that, right? People are always like, oh, I can't, I wish I was in Hollywood, right? Well, they're like, I wish I was an indie making my own stuff. So remember that, right? Because, you know, that, that's what you own. And that's why I love places like Seattle. You know what I mean? That have that indie scene. You know what I'm saying? That are supportive of art like that, right? Because it's becoming a lot harder to compete against these guys. And you can say that the internet is helping, but not really, because you're you still got to get into those distribution companies that have the biggest outreach, right, for your project. So, you know, has anybody cracked that? Uh, not, I don't think so, right? But it does take dedication to your projects, and usually they end up being better the longer you wait. Like a cool. Is there another question? Oh, okay. I mean, Raphael's going to be hanging out, so if you're more of a one on one person, uh, definitely uh, say hi to him. At uh, 5 o'clock, we're going to watch your film. And then at 3 o'clock, uh, Victoria Sutton. Victoria's here, the court marshal of Apache Kid. Um, I, we were talking about the different types of documentaries. This is basically uh, reenactments with the original transcripts and. and but, it could almost be narrative, but it's, it's documentary, right? Do you, yeah, uh -huh. I think it's a mix of two of those styles. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah so that's going to be really great. Also at 3 o'clock here in this room, uh, we're going to talk with the Washington Lawyers for the Arts. Everybody who's a, a filmmaker is going to at some point have some legal issues, and they're going to want to talk to an attorney. The Washington Lawyers for the Arts exists to help out all artists with uh, free consultations and advice, and then low-cost legal aid. So th those guys, you're, you know, you're definitely going to want to talk to and find out how to take advantage of that. And then uh, 7 o'clock, we've got the award ceremony, and we're going to have one hell of a party. And the award ceremony and the party 
it's always free. So if your friends aren't doing anything tonight, we just, just cracked a, a keg of beer from our sponsor, Hellbent. We have plenty of heritage liquor. Uh, we're gonna order some food, and yeah, we're gonna have a blast. So, awesome. all right, thanks so much, yeah. It was great. This was a really, really great session. Thank you, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.